Hey, everybody, and welcome to a very special episode of The Thoughtful Bro, live streaming, as always, on A Mighty Blaze on Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube. As you know, we are here every Tuesday at 2 to talk about what makes great books tick, what makes great authors tick. And before I get into the whole intro, I just want to say what an honor it has been the last two years to be doing this show on A Mighty Blaze. And it has allowed me to not only promote um, other authors, but really kind of more selfishly to meet real literary heroes of mine and people who are making some of the most dynamic and important art today. And I just think today is just really meaningful to me as just another one of those incredible opportunities that just, if you had told me two years ago that I would be able to speak to the Pulitzer Prize winner in biography on a book that I think is just um, a, an American classic um, to be. Um, I just, it's just, uh, it's quite an honor. So uh, this is just a very special episode and I wanted to say that up front, but you will hear all about in the next 45 minutes, how passionately I feel about this book, Chasing Me to My Grave. Um, just a remarkable work. Um, but before we get into all that, a few words about A Mighty Blaze. In case you didn't know, A Mighty Blaze is an all-volunteer initiative to help uh, readers, um, writers reach readers during COVID and beyond in our increasingly virtual world. At A Mighty Blaze, we are never asking for your money. If you want to support us or show the love, just like or subscribe um, on social media. You can sign up for our newsletter on amightyblaze.com. And as I said, all this content is totally free every week. Um, but if you were in the mood to throw some money around, um, I can think of a good way to do it. You could spend it on miraculous books that open the door of both to the beauty and the horror of our racial history in America. Books like Chasing Me to My Grave. Um, that is the best money that you will spend all week. Go ahead and buy one for everybody you know who's interested in art, literature, history, America, or just a great read. Um, so... If you have a comment or a question for Aaron or Patsy, please just pop it into the chat as usual, and we will um, get to it. We'll leave some time for questions from the audience at the end. And without further ado, let's get on to some introductions. So the late Winfred Rembert uh, was an artist from Cuthbert, Georgia. His paintings on carved and tooled leather have been exhibited in museums and galleries all around America. Um, Winfred is the subject of two award-winning documentary films, All Ash, um, All Me and Ashes to Ashes. And in the last decades of his life, he lived in New Haven, Connecticut. He passed away, sadly, uh, in 2021 before this book uh, came out, but he was posthumously awarded the 2022 Pulitzer Prize in Biography. Um, Winfred's wife of over 50 years, Patsy Rembert, uh, who is featured in the book um, and is just sort of the central figure uh, in Winfred's life. She is here with us today. Um, Patsy, welcome to the show. Thank you for being here. Thank you for having me. Beautiful. And then also on the show today is Aaron Kelly. Aaron is um, a professor of philosophy at Tufts University. She earned her PhD from Harvard. She specializes in ethics and criminal law, and she is also the author of The Limits of Blame, Rethinking Punishment and Responsibility. And Erin did win the Pulitzer Prize along with uh, Winfred for 2022 in biography. And Winfred um, actually told the story to Erin, um, who, who wrote it down for this book. So Erin, thank you also for being a part of this show today. It's my pleasure. Wonderful. So about this book, just briefly, Chase Me to My Grave, along with winning the Pulitzer, uh, was Booklist's number one nonfiction book of last year. Um, it was on the book of the year list for NPR, Publishers Weekly, Book Page, Barnes & Noble, Hudson Booksellers, Art News, and more. Brian Stevenson, the legendary Brian Stevenson, the best-selling author of Just Mercy and the executive director of the Equal Justice Initiative, he wrote a foreword to this book. Um, and he said, this is a compelling and important history that this nation desperately needs to hear. And I just wholeheartedly agree. And I think that, you know, you can have great works of art and you can have unique works of art. Um, but I think, with, which this book definitely is, but I think when you add on top of the beauty and the uniqueness of it, it being a story that lands at a time that the nation really needs to hear it is just what catapults a book um, into a different kind of stratosphere uh, and, a, and an area of relevance for all of us. So I think this is just such, not only a beautiful book, but just such a necessary book. Um, but I just, why don't we start today, Aaron, and just tell us a little bit about how you came into the Rembert's lives and just sort of how this book came to be. Sure. I am a philosopher, and as you mentioned, I was um, I have a book that I've written about criminal justice. I was working on that book at the time I met Win Winfred. Um, I had come across his art online. He has these amazing paintings of prisoners, 
And I learned from reading about him that they were autobiographical. He's a formerly incarcerated person. He was. Um, he spent seven years incarcerated, actually nine years incarcerated in Georgia, seven of, seven of them on chain gangs. And um, I became interested in the story behind the paintings. I wanted to hear his ideas about the criminal justice system. I wanted to hear him talk about his life and his experience of incarceration. Um, and so I arranged to meet him. He was very kind and generous and agreed for me to interview him. Um, and I incorporated some parts of those interviews into my philosophy book. And then the project grew from there, according to his interest of the story he wanted to tell about his life growing up in Jim Crow, Georgia, surviving the chain gang, and later in life becoming an artist. So I don't know exactly why it happened that way, but he welcomed me to join in and help him to tell his story. I was interested in hearing it. I thought I could help him to write it. And so we started working together in March 2020. Um, sorry, excuse me, March 2018. And it took us about three years. We worked on it right up until the time of his death. And although he didn't see the final published version of the book, he saw a pre publication copy of it and approved it and was very happy with it. So many thanks and memory of Winfred, who I adore, and Patsy for welcoming me, welcoming me into their home so that um, I could be a part of this journey to share his story with the world. Thank you, Aaron. And one more question for you before um, I go to Patsy for a question. Um, this book, we'll, we'll read a passage from the book later and we'll talk about like the poetry and the storytelling um, of this book, which is so wonderful. But I just have to ask, in that time, 2018 to 2020, Aaron, when he was telling this to you, did you feel like you were sitting on a book, which I believe is a book of like great magnitude and frankly, a book of genius, really? Did you feel like you were sitting on something this special when he was telling you? Yes, I did. He's a remarkable person, extremely talented as an artist. And anyone who talks to him, even for a short period of time, will understand sort of the depth of his command of language, his thoughtfulness, his reflectiveness, his ability to tell a great story. So I was totally swept up by him and interested in his story. And I felt like there was something really important, deep, meaningful, um, and worth sharing in, in those conversations right from the very beginning. So it was it was very exciting. And, you know, we didn't know where it was going to go. We didn't know, I didn't know the shape the book would take um, and sort of what he had, all of what he had lived through and wanted to talk about. I really went into it pretty naive, um, not knowing a whole lot except what I'd read about him um, and through the documentaries that I watched. Um, but as we got deeper and deeper into it, it just became even more amazing. Wow. So the book, folks, is more than 75 prints of Winfred's paintings, along with the story that he narrated um, to, to Aaron. And there's also a chapter um, from the point of view of Patsy in there as well. Um, but we're going to show some of those paintings in a moment. But uh, Patsy, I want to turn to you and just ask, you know, one of the remarkable parts of this remarkable man's life is that he only really started seriously painting um, at the age of 51. And it seemed he probably just messed around a little bit before that, but not really seriously till then. And it was really you who put him on that path to take it seriously. Is that right? Yes. Uh, well, he could always draw and he was always doing things for the kids, but he never took it seriously that anyone would be interested in anything he did. Right. And um, another thing that's so striking about his art, and this is just something that perhaps the most striking thing about it, and it's what pulled me into the book, um, was just its its beauty and its optimism. And I, I wanted you to just talk to me for a minute about Winfred's character, um, because he is a man who went through some horrific things in his life. And yet um, here is this art that doesn't show a trace, even when he's talking about or painting about the most gruesome subjects, it doesn't show bitterness. It doesn't show resentment. Um, and how talk to me about that aspect of Winfred's character. Well, Winfred was a man of love. He loved everybody and he wanted everybody to love him. And uh, he couldn't hold, he thought the things that would happen to him, although how cruel they was, he thought that's the way they felt. They was right. He said some of the things they did, they knew was wrong, but 
he really thought they felt that they was right. So he said it was harder for him to hold anger in his heart than it was mm. for him to have love and a smile on his face. Although it hurt, he just didn't hold no animosity toward anyone. He wanted people it, to understand that he was a man that uh, wanted to be accepted for who he really was. That's the type of person he was. Harder to hold hate than to be a man of love. I mean, those are just words yeah. to live by. Um, so I want to take a moment and show some of these paintings. I have three paintings. Again, there's so many in the work. And we're going to actually link in the chat to Winfred's website. And you can go, excuse me, look at um, look at the paintings there. But let's just put a few up on screen. And then we'll talk about them on the other side. So this one is called All Me Too. And so um, this is, you know, all me, meaning those are all different versions of himself. This is from the time that he spent working on the chain gang. Um, and then this one is, he began uh, his life working in cotton fields when he was just a, a small boy. And um, some of his most beautiful work is from these times in the cotton fields. Um, and he has this one quote that I love. I'm just quoting from memory here from the book, but it says something like a cotton field is the most beautiful thing you could see. But uh, it, cha it changes how beautiful it is to you once you get down in it and start working. Something along those lines. Um, so, and indeed, these cotton field pictures are just wonderful. All right. So, and then here is a picture of uh, Winfred and Patsy. So let's just talk. I just want to turn it back to um, Aaron. Let's go to you. When you see those paintings, just kind of give me an overview. Like what strikes you about them and, you know, even what strikes you just generally about his art? Well, the first, the first two paintings you showed, they are very beautiful, but they're paintings of scenes of struggle and suffering. So it's very striking that somebody who lived through some very difficult traumatic experiences, who was dealing with the scars of those experiences throughout his life, could produce these amazingly imaginative and beautiful and inviting works of art. So they invite the viewer to ask questions, to enjoy some things about the painting, and then to think about their subject matter, which is um, very serious, very personal, and there's a lot behind it to talk about um, and to, um, to think about. And that's what he conveys in the book through his personal experience and his reflections. So I think these are remarkably you know, modern, musical, wonderful senses of comp composition and an amazing way to approach um, some, some very um, deep and difficult personal issues through an aesthetic lens that is inviting to others. And Patsy, what, uh, how does his art strike you? What, what are your thoughts when you see these paintings? Well, you know, it's, it's real life. It's real life. It's life and it's the times that we both had to endure. But Winford endured it in a way that it's it's kind of hard to explain how he viewed it, but he made it look good, even though it was a hard life. Mm -hmm. And he once told me that all me was a way to release the anger and the pain that he was suffering. By being all of those different people, he made himself uh, have different personalities. He could be whatever he wanted to be to escape whatever situation he was in. He could tune himself into that type of person in order to fit in. That was his main thing to fit in. In this picture, I don't know how he did it. I really don't. <laughs> and this... It, it's this is just a small piece of, of these paintings. Um, there, yeah. there's so many beautiful ones. You know, Patsy. On that note, one of the things that I wanted to engage with you guys about on this interview is, you know, as a white person um, living in a country that has such um, a fraught and often horrific. Um, racial past, a past that we have not really dealt with and sort of are only more recently beginning to deal with and recognize. Um, I think just speaking frankly for a lot of white people, um, it, it, it's hard. 
it is a difficult thing to realize like this is what white people did in this country and it's new this is new information i was i personally even having read a lot about black history was surprised um at um how dark some of these episodes were in his life um that he went through i mean he was going through some of these things within 10 years of when i was born i mean and so it's just our recent history and i what i want to say is that i feel that um one of the wonderful things about this book is the paintings are so beautiful and the storytelling is so um full of wisdom and and often optimism that it is a, a doorway into the subject matter for for people i'm speaking particularly of white people um that's my perspective but just you know something so beautiful you just instinctively want to know more about it and you think like okay look at this painting like i mean as aaron was saying earlier this is such a beautiful complex interesting painting and then you think okay what is this painting really about and it's actually about a completely unjust and often corrupt justice system um that destroyed parts of, of Winford's life. And anyway, I just wanted to see what you thought about that, Patsy, just the kind of the joy and beauty of the work being an entryway for people to engage with something darker. Well, you know, the, the beauty of it is you don't know what it is when you first look at it. But the sadness of it is that he had to be all these many different people in order to survive. That's the sad part about it. He couldn't be what he really wanted to be. He wanted to be one person. He wanted to be the person that he became to be after. But those personalities followed him. Mm -hmm. But the beauty and the patience that he took to do these pictures is just, I mean, it's wonderful. But it's a sadness to it when you know the history of the picture. Right. All of them are him. Now, why should he have to be so many different people? in order to survive. That's the sadness of it. And now, Aaron, you might have something different you want to say about it. Well, I think, and, and I've heard you talk about this too, that it was important for Winfred in telling his story to also tell the story of other people that, that lived through the kinds of things he went through um, or were in the part of the South where he and you both lived. Um, and there are other people in the book whose stories are incorporated into the book. But I think that he thought that his story also conveyed something larger about the history, the very recent history of this country and its impact on all of these tensions that we're dealing with today in the present that I think he thought should be addressed and talked about. And so he, as a writer of this book, as somebody telling, willing to tell his life story and all the detail that he did, he wanted to educate people. Um, so I think that um, if people feel open to being educated by it in the way that Mark was just describing, that is just wonderful. And that Winford would have been thrilled about that. He was hoping for that. He wanted that. Um, and I think he had a special way of doing that. Yes. Yeah. And um, I see we have a lot of questions coming in from the audience, folks. We st we will definitely get to those um, towards the end of the interview. But I just want to go a little bit deeper on this issue of um, whiteness. I mean, Aaron, you and I had talked about this earlier, and I had made the comment to you, I do not know if this is right or if this is just a, a strange or ridiculous thing to say, but I had thought for a moment. I'm like, I wonder if the fact that Aaron was white maybe um, – had a certain effect on the book in the sense that if Winfred was talking to another person of color, that person might have thought, well, uh, like Winfred is starts telling of the horrors of the South. And then they and then Winfred might think, well, this person already knows this history, you know, and so like, I don't need to go on. We don't need to relive this. We 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 know about this. But since it was Aaron and again, Aaron, I am really like <laughs> speculating about the situation. But, you know, I think there was Aaron, you had said to me there were times when he thought he said to you, hey, Aaron, I don't know if you really know how bad it was. Let me make sure I explain it to you. And so maybe the fact that you were white made him really go deep and explain these things in such a rich way. Yeah, I've, I've thought about that. It's an interesting question. Um, and I think you may be right about that. Of course, the story came out in a certain way as he told it to me. It would have been different as he told it to another person and in some respects. But 
you know, we were both aware that my life experience is very different from his in many ways. Um, so he, he invited me to ask probing questions, which I did. Um, sometimes that was difficult for both of us and, you know, kind of jarring to hear the details of his life, but he was very courageous about it. And I think because he couldn't assume that I understood or that I'd had a similar experience that he was um, careful to elaborate and explain and um, try to get me to understand as best as he thought that I could. Um, so I think um, I think it is an interesting question, and it also shows that you know many um, difficult things can be talked about across lines of um, pretty profound difference. Patsy, what do you? I'm curious what you think about that. Well, I, I kind of knew what he thought because he told me. Well, he wanted black people to understand because it's so you'd be surprised at how many don't know their history and don't want to hear it. They want to close it off. Those that know it want to close it off and forget about it and pretend that it never happened. And the ones that don't know about it, he feel like if they knew, especially the young people, if they knew the pain and suffering that we endured, it wouldn't be so hard on each other. It would mm. be more loving and understanding if they knew their history. If they knew how we had to hide, how we had to be together, or how we had to pull together in order to be safe, he felt like telling this story might would bring about a change within the young person's life because they're not being told about their history, their true history, what we went through, and what price was paid for them to be free, to sit on the front of the bus. They don't seem to understand that that was a high price that people in Memphis era had to pay. Even when they're talking about Rosa Clark or Emmett Till, they don't seem to understand that was the price that was paid for them to be free. Mm. So that's what he wanted to convey, not only to the, he wanted the white person to understand that it's true, that we were slaves and we was, even after slavery, we were still treated as slaves. Nothing changed, really. And he wanted the young black man to see his place, where he should be and what his thinking should be, not to hurt each other and to learn, most of all, learn was his biggest thing, education, to learn all you can learn. And mm -hmm. uh, that's what he was trying to convey. And he wanted the uh, black people to that knew about it. You know, we got something to know about it. Don't want you to put up nothing that reminds you of what we went through. He wanted you to see everything, to know everything. He said, that's the only way that the young black man will ever know. He's got to know where he come from and what the price was paid for him. And if we keep it here, how are you going to know? He think he's just born into privilege. Mm -hmm. It's not. So that's what he wanted. Yeah, there was a part in the book, there's something that he said where he was skeptical of the civil rights movement at first in the early 60s. He's like, you know, they're doing these bus protests, but, you know, the way the system is set up, it's just too powerful. They'll never, um, they'll never succeed. And then he said, but then I started to see that Black Americans were willing to die for this. And he said, when I saw that, then I thought the civil rights movement will work. And I just bring that up in the context of you saying people maybe not remembering what a price there was to pay. Yeah, that was the basis of it. So, um, Patsy, I wanted to just give you a moment to tell part of his life story. And so for those um, who are listening, the life that Winfred led um, is in many ways uh, just a complete encapsulation of the Jim Crow South. He started as picking cotton, then he got involved in the civil rights movement. Um, he was put in prison and worked on the chain gang. Um, he was during that time uh, nearly lynched, um, just came frankly within seconds of losing his life. And um, there's so much wonderful storytelling about this in the book, and we can't get into all of it now. But mm -hmm. Patsy, I'm just wondering if you'd be willing to just tell the story 
um, of how he was nearly lynched because it's just a remarkable story. It's... If it's if it's too much to get into, we can we can move to another topic. It's um, Aaron, would you mind? All right, I'll, I'll start, and you can join in. You know, yeah. if you'd like Stop. to. So Winfred okay. had attended um, a demonstration in America, Georgia, uh, civil rights protest. Um, and the protest turned violent. Um, and to get away from the violence, he um, took a car with keys in it and drove off. So he stole a car and drove it back to Cuthbert, was later arrested, had been um, sitting in jail after that for almost two years. Um, and he got frustrated. He plugged the toilet in his cell and flooded it. And the deputy sheriff came back and began to beat him up. Um, there was a struggle. Winfred decided to fight back after initially thinking that he wouldn't. Um, and he he um, he wrestled the gun away from the deputy sheriff and locked him in the cell and escaped. Um, so now he's on the run. He's in big trouble. Um, he went to some people who he thought would protect him, and they called the police who um, came, rearrested him. And that's when, you know, this terrible... Um, episode of um, violence happened to him where he was taken out to the edge of town and strung up in a tree and nearly, nearly castrated and killed. Um, so he, he wasn't, fortunately, um, I think, in, in a way, unbelievably to him, he thought he was, you know, it was it was the end. Um, and um, instead, they took him back to town and sentenced him to 27 years in the state penitentiary for various charges that they put together. Um, fortunately, he served um, a lot less time than that. They released him after seven years. He doesn't know why. So it happened in the context of a, a sequence of events um, that, you know, un unfolded with kind of ever increasing um, violence um, against him. Um, and I don't know if Patsy want, wants to add anything to kind of... You know, it's... I want to explain myself. Sometime I'm okay with talking about the horrors that he went through, and sometime I'm not. Please forgive me. Uh, I, I, I'm unlike Winford. I'm still angry. I, I'm still angry with what happened to him. Uh, I don't know exactly how I would have been if had it didn't happen to me or one of my brothers. It hurts to know that he had to suffer the way that he suffered. But Wilford had a terrific memory. He remembered, and I'm hoping someday in this world that I'll get a chance to see where they took him. He remembered step by step. He remembered the time, how much time it took him to get to where they took him. He remembered the turns, even though he was in the trunk of the car. We went back to that place but we couldn't go down the road to it because it had no trespassing. I wanted so badly to go on the other side of that fence and see how close he was because he remembered where they took him. What this place was like, who these people was that felt that this was okay to do him the way that they did. And uh, he, he still struggled. See, you see this part of his life. There's another part of Winfrey's life that the chain gang hindered him from doing the things that he could have done. He taught himself a whole lot of things. The chain gang hurt him greatly for being bound down when he was, re when, when they said they freed him, they let him come home. He was still in jail. He was still in that cotton field. And that's what, this book is doing is taking, even though he's not here, I'm hoping that it takes him out of that cotton field, out of that life that he had to live and the brutality that he had to suffer with no one to speak for him. So that that is uh, my summing up of some of his life, but there's so much more. But he wanted to get this part out. And Aaron, I am forever thankful to you for coming along and putting it in words that relates to how he talked, to how he expressed this stuff. You captured it beautifully, and I thank you. 
Thank you, Patsy. <clears throat> Got me choked up here. Um, Patsy, can you talk about when you went back there at the end of his life to Cuthbert, Georgia, and the place that he was lynched and there in the town when he grew up, and now he's welcomed in a very different kind of way, and he's seen as... Oh, <laughs> that was so exciting for him now. When he went back and they received him the way that they did, that was the best thing in his life. That's He wanted to prove that he was somebody. And he accomplished that feat when he did the art, when the book was cut. He had another book before this one. But when this book was in the horizon, to know that this book was going to come out, this was the wonderfulest thing I think could have ever happened to him, was to go back home as somebody. He left in chain, come back heroic. Mm. So I think that was the biggest thing. And for me to go and represent him after his passing, it was an honor. It was an honor. I, I was so proud to be able to speak about his life and to hold that book that Aaron and him had written together. It was, I mean, it was just wonderful. And to see the smiles on his children's face, what their father had accomplished in his life. He struggled, but he still, he didn't give up. He kept trying different things and this worked. So I was, oh, I was too proud to uh, be there. <laughs> it's, it's such a story. It's such an astonishing story, uh, not just the way it's told, but just the, the arc of his life and where he began and where he ended up. Uh, I mean, it, the book just feels miraculous to me. It's just, it's, I feel, you know how I feel? I feel like I think of all the ways that this book could not have happened. I think of like, if Aaron kind of didn't meet him, Patsy, if you somehow, if you and he were not in the right place at the right time and, the, and mm -hmm. your, your publisher wasn't open to it and just all the ways that this book could not have happened. And I just think mm -hmm. what a treasure would have been lost if this book didn't get made, but thank God it did. Um, you know, I want to just read for a minute from this. Um, you know, a lot of people, there was a question in the chat about how did the book get named? Like, what was it? What is it? What's the meaning of the name of the book? And there's a passage that I want to read. It's about three paragraphs long. It'll take about a minute, um, but it, it will explain what the, how the book got its name. And this is just an example, people, of the just incredibly beautiful rhythmic, um, writing that you see in this book. So this is a book, this is a chapter called Searching for the Riverbanks. And he mentions that um, he'd been watching the show Roots and Kunta Kinte, who in the show came from Africa to America as a slave. He looks out at the ocean and he says, where are the riverbanks? Because he had never seen a body of water that wasn't a river that didn't have riverbanks. And so Kunta Kinte is disoriented and thinking, what am I doing here? And then the passage begins this way. This is in the voice of Winfred now. In my life, I might have thought, where are the riverbanks? What am I doing here? Why am I being treated this way? Why is life so hard for me? I got shackled. That's the way my life went. I'm looking back from where I came from. I'm lucky to be here from what I've been through. I see the mob. I'm looking at them right now, hitting me with their ax handles and guns. I'm looking at them right now. I see them shackling me. Those shackles, they're still on me. I'm still wearing them. No one has the key to the shackles that are holding me. I don't. I don't think I'll ever be set free. I'm on the run. I don't know if people know what I mean when I say that, but I'm still running. I don't know if I can say the words to make people understand. My life, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21. Those were tough years. I'm running from the police and not just physically. I'm running and I think they'll be chasing me for the rest of my life. I get up three or four times every night thinking about these things. I dream about them too, and I'm fighting. Sometimes I fall out of bed, I'm fighting so hard, and it's so real in my sleep. I'm getting chased and beat up, not for crimes I committed, but crimes that in my dreams, they say I committed. The police are chasing me and trying to lock me up. Sometimes they catch me, and sometimes they don't. Sometimes I'm in a fight, and sometimes I'm not. I think they'll be chasing me until I'm in my grave. When I read that passage, I just had to put the book down. 
it was just an overwhelming experience to read a passage like that. And I just want to turn it to either of you just to talk about passages like that in the book and what that meant. Well, Wifford had to go, well, he started seeing a psychiatrist. It was, you know, friends of his it's thought that maybe that would help him because he did have nightmares. He would be asleep and he would wake up fighting. And I had to stop sleeping with him because he would be fighting so fiercely, he thought he would hurt me. So I slept in the next room next to him so I can hear him when he, I would go into his room and, and wake him all the way up. But he did. He had nightmares. And one day he told me, he said, I don't think nothing is going to be able to stop this. He said, when I die, that's when it's going to stop. Now, Aaron, I know you talk with you about it, too, about those feelings. And, and uh, I wish you'd share what you what he told you. Yeah, I mean, what what he told me is in the book. There are um, some, I think, really profound thoughts of his in that last chapter of the book. I think the last chapter of the book is my favorite part of the book. And we also wrote it last. And I have this really clear memory of working on those passages and then reading them, Patsy, to you and to Winfrey yeah. for sitting on your porch. It was the summertime and it was hard to read them out loud. I felt very emotional. And then when I read those passages, um, we all three cried and just shared this moment on the porch. You know, you could hear the birds singing and it was just like, you know, we just felt this sense of relief that we had come to that point in the book. And I felt this profound sense of appreciation for Winfred's courage. And I felt this love for him, for what he'd been able to talk about and tell me. Um, and it was just that coming together of the last chapter that was just so, I don't know, both painful and satisfying at the same time. Mm. So I wanna take a, uh, the last few questions here before we get to some audience questions and just talk about where we're at as a country. Um, as Brian Stevenson said, this book is um, a necessary book. It's a, story, it's a history that this nation needs to hear. I wholeheartedly agree. Um, but, you know, in the last 10 years, there's been a lot that's happened. Um, you know, Trayvon Martin got killed about 10 years ago. Um, then, you know, more recently we have George Floyd and the, the Black Lives Matter movement. And it seems that uh, things are changing, but then also it just seems like things are just the same as they were. And Patsy, I just want to know, as somebody who lived through so much of the worst, frankly, of the last 75 years, um, where do you feel like we're at today? Oh, my God. Well, I hate to say it, but I think we're going back, not going forward. I don't see the horizon being better than it was because of what other people are doing and what kind of tragedy that they're bringing in, what kind of stories. And it's the same old lie. You're taking my job. It's the same lie. Um, you're more privileged than me. And they're giving you my rights. That is the sentiments that I get. And I don't think it's getting any better because now it's on both sides. The young black man is killing us and the white man is figuring out a way how to lock us up forever mm. never let you out so it's worse in my view patsy do you think that this book um what like how do you see this book as impacting the way things are well if the if this being read and people really take a, a view of it and just stop and think what can I do after reason? What can I do to change this situation? First thing is talk about it. Understand what he's saying and what he's talking about. It's now, it don't have to be this way. If we come together and look at each other as a human being, not as a color, take the color aspect out of it and look at each other as a human being, it can change. It can change. And can I ask both of you, and then after this, we'll go into audience questions. What is the best or most rewarding 
uh, piece of feedback that you've gotten since the book has come out? Some, something somebody wrote to you or maybe said to you? Oh, so many, so many, so many things. Uh, um, but they mostly come from white people just saying that they appreciate him, this book. They appreciate what he had to say. And they are so sorrowful about what had happened to him. Those were the sign of things that make you cry. I got cards and stuff. If I'd have thought of it, I'd have mm. brought some. But uh, those are the things that um, ring so true to me that I'm sure he would have loved to have read uh, or that people was coming back to him. And, I, you know, just appreciating what he had done and about the book. How but, about you, Aaron? Oh, sorry, you had to go ahead. That's all right, go ahead. Well, what I would mention is what several people have told me, and I think, Mark, you might have even said something similar to this, which is that when you read the book, this is what I've been told by a number <laughs> of people, it feels like Winfred is telling you this story across the kitchen table. Yes. And that really makes me feel good because we were trying so hard to you know, capture his voice and organize it in a way that would really sound like him. Of course, the readers don't know him, but it's believable that it's him. It conveys his story in his, not only artwork, but in his words. Um, so that kind of feature of the writing of the book, you know, taking his words and arranging them in the book so that they would be his words and they would sound like the way he talks was really important to me. And I love that feedback. And you know, one more thing about writing this book for a long time, he held back because he didn't know how the book would be accepted with the things he had to say. And uh, he felt like he was at, well, I, I think he knew he was at the end of his life. And in the book, he says it, he says, this was the perfect time for him to do this book because they can't hurt him anymore. Mm. Now that's hard, that's hard. But he felt like he was at the end of his life and he, he was at the end of his life. And I think he knew he was dying. No one told me, but I know in my heart now that he knew he was dying. So he wanted to get this out. He got it out. He accomplished his goal was to tell his story. And he wanted to tell it in a way where it would be no backlash on him for what he had to say. Because he wanted to tell the truth about what happened and how it happened. Hmm. And uh, he opened up, I hope, some eyes to a lot of things that was being said and done to him at the time. And I think that's why he said this was the perfect time for him to write this book. That stays with me all the time. Patsy, I think I heard you say in a different interview that you feel like he was put on earth to write this book. Is that, yes. is that right? Yes, I believe this was his calling. I wanted, mm -hmm. I think, now I don't know who believe in the Lord. I don't know who believe in what I believe in, but I believe that he was ordained to do this book to tell this story. I really do. Yeah. I don't think no one else could have told it. And no one else definitely couldn't have read it, written it any better than Erin did. Mm -hmm. I, I appreciate her so much. Erin, we might have lost you there. So if you want to just log out, you can log back in and we'll put you back on. Um, all right. Well, in the meantime, while we're waiting for Erin uh, to get her... Um, to get her feedback. Why don't we just go into some audience questions? All right. All right, here we go. So this is from Jenna Blum, um, a question for the authors and I'm sure Mark will cover it. Um, I'm always interested in writing as a collaboration. Um, what was the process, the best part and the biggest challenge? And I will bring Erin back. Maybe we can get her audio, um, but go ahead, Patsy. Well, I, I didn't write the book. The biggest thing was to get him to agree to go ahead on and do it. <laughs> <You know? laughs> that was the biggest thing. And because he kept saying, no one wants to hear my story. I said, I want to hear it. And I would, 
I know your grandchildren would want to hear and know about their grandfather and what type of life you had to live. Somebody needs to know about it. And I thought it was something that the world needed to know. And I kept urging him and urging him. And a friend of his was uh, Phil McBlain and Sharon McBlain. They was all in there with me trying to convince him that this was a good idea to get this book done. And when Erin come along, she was a God sent person. Mm. I believe everything happened according to the way God wanted it to happen. She came along and to tell it to a white person that could put it down on paper the way that she did and was able to deal with the different aspects of what he was talking about. I thought that was great. I thought she was great to be able to capture that. Mm -hmm. so I hope that answers the question on my it, part. It does. It does. Um, you know, and I know that in the book he talked about, oh, we have another audience question here, but just before we get to that, he talked about um, how hard it was to to do this. And I think like, I don't want to um, skip over that. And like, for example, um, about the lynching, for example, that's something he, he had an extraordinarily hard time even talking about. And so um, yeah. clearly there was just, uh, this is a, a real process that you guys had to go to just to dig up some of these terrible memories. Yes, he, he did a picture called Almost Me. Mm -hmm. And that picture, I think, stayed in his mind that that could have been him with mm -hmm. the rope around his neck and not around his feet. Mm -hmm. Even our whole life was a was a trip. It, you mm -hmm. know, just me and him meeting was not supposed to be. Yeah. But Aaron is back. I'm Aaron so sorry. Back. Something went wrong with my computer. Oh, no problem. You're just in time. So let's just uh, finish up that question, though. It was, um, you know, what, um, it just if you could talk about um, the... Jenna Blum, who is an author as well, she says, you know, what I'm always interested in co collaborative writing. Like, how did that work uh, from your perspective? Oh, sure. So there was a lot of reading out loud. I interviewed and re recorded all the interviews with Winfred. And then I would take my tape recorder home. I would transcribe parts of it, arrange it, um, the parts that seem, you know, compelling and that should be in the book. And then I'd go back to New Haven and read them out loud. And that would lead to this whole further conversation about what should be added, what was left out, how did he feel about what I wrote? And it would, so there were all these kind of cycles for each chapter. Um, and um, reading out loud is a great way to write too, because you hear what it sounds like. And if it doesn't sound good, you got to change it. Um, so that was our method. And we read the whole book together out loud, each chapter several times with Winfred elaborating and reflecting on sort of how things were going. It was very interesting. Right. Great. Thank you, Aaron. So let's do one uh, more audience question. I think we had a question in there for Aaron as well. Um, if we could put that other question up. So this is from Ellen. Thanks for this question. Uh, for Aaron, how did you and Winfred bridge the gaps between your lived experiences? I listened very carefully and I gave Winfred a lot of room to talk. I didn't have an agenda of my own. I We opened up the conversation. I told him we're going to take our time. You say what you need to say, and I'm going to listen and take it where you want to go. So I felt like that was the best way to bridge the gaps in our experience was to be um, just re receptive and open to hearing what he had to say and to make sure that he had the time and the space to say what he wanted to say. Great. Um, so folks, we, we're going to wrap here soon. And um, I just before we do, I have one last question for them. But I just want to take a moment to say that please just um, buy this book. It is, it's an important book. It's a beautiful book. It's everything I think that literature could should be um, in the sense that it's uh, just something delightful and beautiful and captivating. Um, on the surface, um, and you can just take it at that level if you want. But then as you dig underneath it, you find out um, some hard truths about our country. But these are truths that everybody needs to know and understand. And um, I just can't think of a book that in a more engaging, spellbinding way um, opens the doors to, to our nation's past in this way. Um, before we close, I just want to ask you both, uh, maybe Aaron first, um, what 
do you think Winfred would think of all of the success and praise, the way this book was received? I know you said earlier that he was able to see an advanced reader copy. He was happy with it. He knew this was going to happen, but he didn't know that it would win the Pulitzer Prize. He didn't know the way um, that this book has been received so far, and I think will continue, continue to be received for a long time to come. And I'm just curious, knowing him, what you think he would have thought about all that. I think he would have been really proud and very happy. And I think he would love to have been here talking about the book, signing the book, sharing <laughs> his thoughts about the book. You know, he would love, he was a man that loved to be in the spotlight and um, especially talking about his life um, in the way that he wanted to talk about it. So I think he would have loved it. And I think he, he, this would have been a dream for him really. And he came close, he came close. Um, and he's left his story for, for the rest of us to, to share and talk about. So, yeah. You, you know, his last night on this earth, we talked about the book. And I said, this is going to be a bestseller. And I told him that. He saw, I said, yes, it's going to be a bestseller. And we... We kissed and laughed, and I was just so excited because y'all had sent over the review of the book, Aaron, what y'all had done. And I told him, I said, this is going to be a bestseller. And that's what I had told him his last night on this earth. And we both laughed about it. And and he said, oh, you always say that. You always think. I said, it's true. It's going to be a bestseller, honey. How did I know? <laughs> How did I know? <laughs> but that was the last thing I told him. We talked about it after you know you sent over the preview copy, and I looked at it. I said, "This is gonna be a bestseller," and I think from that because he was smiling and he was laughing, and he was saying, "Okay, okay, all right," because I always think most about what he done and everything that he did was great in my eyes and he was and still is my favorite subject <laughs> <laughs> I can't help it. man god i i don't know if I've, I've done about 80 of these shows and i haven't cried in one of them and now you got me crying twice in <laughs> one in one episode <laughs> oh in case you didn't know, folks, or couldn't figure it out, this is also a love story, this book. Um, it's a great, great, great love story between Patsy and Winfred and the beautiful family that they have as well with eight children. So um, anyway, um, this has been so wonderful, such an honor. Um, I just can't even tell you how wonderful I think this book is and uh, how happy I am you two made time for our audience today. Um, Aaron Kelly... Patsy Rembert, thank you so much, and congratulations to you both. Um, you're going to be going to the Pulitzer Prize dinner, I understand, pretty soon. Is that right? Yes. Yes. <laughs> well, that should be absolutely fantastic. Um, everybody, please, uh, please buy this book. Um, I, uh, I thank you both again, and we will see you next time on The Thoughtful Bro. Patsy and Aaron, thank you so much.